the red pill sidebar. Introduction by Red Pill School. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the Red Pill. We've got almost a hundred subscribers in exactly two weeks. This is incredible. Why have we grown up so quickly? Because there's truth in the red pill. Because men are realizing that the sexual marketplace has shifted away from what we've been taught. Men who grew up over 30 years ago are discovering the world has changed. Men who are still growing up from the 80s, 90s, and even the last decade, they're starting to realize that what their parents taught them, what television and chick flicks taught them, what church and Sunday school taught them, it's all wrong. Our culture has become a feminist culture. A president cannot be elected today without succumbing to the feminist narrative and paying them tribute. How many times has Obama given credit for his manhood to his wife? How many times has the debate hinged on women's pay gap, which is a myth that gets lip service because if you don't, you're a misogynist. I'm not here to parade the concepts of men's rights, nor am I here to discuss self-improvement tips that slash r slash seduction now purports are to make you a better man not get laid more often i am here to say for better or worse the frame around public discourse is a feminist frame and we've lost our identity because of it but this isn't the end of the world the world is changing but men are still part of it we just need to make sure we're changing with it. It's too easy to blame feminism for our troubles. Men, our happiness is our responsibility. Culture has always shifted. It's dynamic and fluid. It has never and will never stay still. Feminism was inevitable. Equal rights are something I am strongly am in support of for men and women. Women have the right to pursue happiness. Nobody should tell them otherwise. Maximizing happiness is the goal of every living creature on this planet. Men, we need to recognize that since women are rightfully seeking out happiness, evolutionary psychology is more relevant today than ever in the past century and possibly longer. We no longer run the show, and I, for one, don't disagree that marriage had to change if we were to see equal rights. But now it's time to get serious and realize that our strategy needs to change. Feminism is a sexual strategy. It puts women into the best position they can find to select mates to determine when they want to switch mates to locate the best DNA possible and to garner the most resources they can individually achieve. The red pill is men's sexual strategy. Reality is happening and we need to make sure that we adjust our strategy accordingly. Welcome to the red pill. It's a difficult pill to swallow, understanding that everything you were taught, everything you were led to believe is a lie. But once you learn it, internalize it, and start living your new life, it gets better. As an introduction to the topic, I want to outline what our focus is here at the slash r slash the red pill. Mastering game. Game is an important portion of a sexual strategy. A lot of you probably came here from slash r slash seduction and are probably wondering why we need a new subreddit if one dedicated to game already exists. The reason is simple. Game is a facet of the red pill sexual strategy. 
Determining good game is impossible to do so without first understanding the context given by the red pill's framework. Something I keep seeing over on the seduction subreddit is a problem taking over most relationship and sex forums. The desire to feminize the discussion, basically making it sound politically correct if read by a female. Yes, game got a bad reputation from girls who demonize manipulation. This is because game is an effective strategy against their own sexual strategy. I believe women's opposition to game can be attributed to the unconscious factors in women's sexual strategy. Please do read schedules of mating. When women started becoming vocal about their opposition to game, that's when men decided it would be necessary to game more politically correct. Oh, we're not here to manipulate women to have sex with us. We're here to become better men. And thus, the female imperative took over game. When men think they must define their own sexual strategy in a way that best delivers results to the female sexual strategy, you know your own strategy will suffer. In a game of chess, do I politely not take out the opposition's queen in hopes not to offend or win the game? Defining the strategy Because of the necessity to have good game, we must define what good game is. A large portion of red pill discussion revolves around evolutionary psychology. Understanding the facets of this psychology are key to developing a good sexual strategy. Because this strategy is useful not only in gaining the attention of the opposite sex, but continuing relationships, having children, and maximizing your own happiness throughout life, I'm going to argue that defining the strategy outside of just good game is an important facet of red pill discussion. Acknowledging reality. Finally, I think our focus should always remain on ensuring that we challenge the reality we perceive and discuss precisely and objectively whether or not our beliefs line up with the testable results we can replicate. I am a firm believer that potential success can only be maximized by maximizing your knowledge of the factors surrounding your success. Keeping your eyes closed and ignoring evidence and facts will not benefit you. Opening your eyes and acknowledging everything no matter how good, bad, or painful it may seem is instrumental in making decisions that will lead to the happiest, most successful outcomes. Confessions of a Reformed Incel by M3 In honor of my 10,000th view, I am going to publish what I consider the hardest post I have ever written, but it needs to be written for I may be an extreme, I know I'm not alone. This isn't written for the PUA or the Alpha or the Pussy Slayer. This is written for you, the one without hope. To know there is hope and you can get better. It is so very hard to hit that publish button. Writing this post is a source of shame for me. It's been sitting in my drafts for about five weeks, five plus months actually. But at this point in my life, having endured what I have, it does not trouble me putting it out in the sphere. I am sure I am not alone in this and that this post will actually help someone out there. Some of you may relate. Women hopefully may finally understand where my anger and cynicism stems from. So I've decided to unleash it. Firstly, before you continue, please go read this post. No offense to the author, but past wasn't her fault. But it struck the unusual 
but it struck the usual nerve with me. You need to read posts like this to let the feeling of inequality fill you up. Reading the link recommended. Title I am fat, 40, and single, and I've been getting laid like crazy. Women are conditioned to believe that no one wants to sleep with them unless they're young and thin. Not in my experience. Early last year, I ended a monogamous relationship with someone I had been with for more than a decade. In the aftermath of the breakup, I decided that what I wanted at this stage in my life was sex and lots of it. I dubbed 2013 my year of fucking recreationally and set out to find some hot, sweaty, messy, dirty, uncomplicated fun with like-minded friends. And find it, I did. Here are some things I learned about what it's really like to seek casual sex as a 40-year-old fat chick. Now, I should note that when I tell you I'm fat, I really mean it. I'm not just slightly chubby and complaining about those last 15 pounds. I'm rather short and weigh almost precisely 300 pounds. I wear size 28 clothing. Unless you think such things are mutually exclusive, I would describe myself as reasonably pretty in a natural, low-maintenance, naughty librarian kind of way. I am fiercely intelligent, deeply hilarious, casually stylish, utterly unselfconscious, and really genuinely nice. I am also an absolute riot in the sack and I've been getting laid like crazy. I am certainly not everyone's cup of tea and I'm not at all offended by the fact. I respect that attraction is a personal thing and that lots of guys just aren't into what I have to offer. That's okay with me as long as they're not dicks about it. I have my own tastes and preferences as well, so I'm certainly not going to begrudge anyone else theirs. If you have a mullet or a mustache or you don't know how to use their, their, and they are correctly, I'm probably not going to be attracted to you. And I'm allowed to feel that way just as you are allowed to feel any way you wish about me. But don't do as one man did and send me a message out of the blue on plenty of fish to tell me that my mere presence there is disgusting and that I shouldn't subject normal people to the affront of having to see my picture on that site. You go have your fun and let me have mine. During the course of this year, I have had a lot of sex with a lot of different partners. And I'm not the least bit apologetic about that fact. Everyone involved has been a consenting adult, communication about expectations and boundaries was clear, and safeguarding my sexual health is always at the forefront of my mind. So why not? Some have developed into lovely ongoing sexual relationships, and some were deliciously filthy little adventures where we never laid eyes on one another again after we parted ways. All were honest expressions of my current sexuality. I've discovered that there are a few different categories that the men who are interested in me tend to fall into, based both on those who I have hooked up with and the many others I have chatted with on the couple of different dating websites I belong to. One type that I have learned to pretty re quickly recognize is the bucket list guy. He has never been with a big woman but wants to give it a go just to see what it's like and get a check mark on his sexual bucket list. Innocent enough I suppose but not sufficiently 
fulfilling from my perspective for me to be bothered. These guys are often in their 20s and really like the fact that I am an older woman. Perhaps that would allow them to check off two boxes at once. Much more toxic are the attracted but ashamed guys who chat me up on occasion. They are secretly really turned on by fat women but are so uncomfortable with that fact that they would never dream of being seen in public with one. They are the living embodiment of the old joke. What do a fat chick and a moped have in common? They're both fun to ride but you wouldn't want your friends to see you on one. On the other end of the spectrum are the men who fetishize large bodies to an extent that is creepy and objectifying. To them, I am not a person as much as an assembly of measurement and body parts. I don't encounter too many of those guys, but when I do, I always feel like I need to take a shower after talking to them. That is not to say that I think there is anything creepy about being attracted to my body type. Far from it. Probably my favorite guys are those who find me really really physically attractive and have no problem owning that desire. Guys who love my softness, guys who massage my belly, who grab handfuls of my ass, who bury themselves between my breasts, guys who can't get enough of every last inch of me. To them, I am a revelation, an ample woman with no body shame who says, sure, Let's have sex with the lights on. One such friend tells me that he long ago stopped approaching women he was attracted to in bars. He is quite a conventionally attractive man with an extremely muscular build and his preference is for women of my size or even larger. The most common reaction he would receive was one of anger from women who were so conditioned to believe in their own unattractiveness that they automatically assumed he was making fun of them. When I began this journey of discovery earlier this year, I might have been one of them. It had been many years since I had dated and although I have been fat my whole adult life, my body now is larger than the one I had when I was last single. I had no idea what to expect on the dating scene. One of the first men I met after the separation was someone I initially assumed was completely out of my league. He is the absolute package, smart, successful, a hell of a nice guy, not to mention extremely handsome with the gym perfected body of a Greek god. The kind of guy who can pretty much have his pick of woman. To my surprise, he was incredibly into me and continues to be to this day. We were lying in bed one night after some of the best sex of either of our lives and I asked him what it was that had attracted him to me in the first place. I knew I wasn't the type he always went for so I was curious. He just looked at me and shrugged and smiled and said, confidence is sexy. Those words were a touchstone for me. That friend belongs to the last group of guys and I would say it is the last one I encounter. It is the largest one I encounter. Guys who are open minded to all kinds of sexiness. They don't have a physical type and have enjoyed women of a variety of shapes and sizes. To them, my sex appeal has more to do with my spirit of adventure and capacity for joyous abandon than the composition of my body. I realize that my lifestyle is not for everyone and I would never try to assert that it should be. I'm sure it won't even be the life for me forever. But at this moment, I am having a great time exactly having exactly the kind of sex I want. And I'm doing it with the body I have right now. Because whatever I look like, I have a right to pursue pleasure without shame and no matter what anyone else has been telling you, so do you.